All right. Hey, what's your dog's name? Oh, this is Bodie. Oh. My right hand guy right here. He decided oh. he wanted to hope you don't mind. No, the more the merrier. He was actually um my gift to myself at my first ninety days of really? uh, true. Yeah, they tell you to get a plant or a fish and to steer away from relationships and other things like that, but I just I couldn't stand being alone. And I went and uh it was just some random stop on a highway. I saw the, the dumb friends league, the pound. And I pulled in and I went there and uh there he was. So he's been with me ever since. Oh wow. So uh, I yeah. think that le- I think that leads into a good first question is uh it's been a few years now, right? So how long have you had your pup and how long have you uh managed to stay sober for? I'm going on four and a half years. As a matter of fact, the ninth will be four years and six months. Really? Wow. Can, well, congratulations, man. That's a big accomplishment. I hope you're super, super proud of yourself for, for doing that because you deserve to be. You know, we have to tell ourselves that in recovery because it's not one of those programs that you walk through and people pat you on the shoulder daily and say stuff. It's just something you got to keep tabs on yourself. So I am very proud. And uh, I got to tell you, I've met some of the greatest people in recovery as well. You know, I think there's a there's a wrongful facade out there of what it is to be an addict. And uh, I think if people were more woke to it, I hate that term, but I'm going to use it, uh, sure. that they would see it differently. So I appreciate that. First of all, what made you decide that you wanted to, to lead a sober lifestyle? What was that switch that flipped in you? Hatred, mm. embarrassment, uh, humiliation. Uh, having a legacy that I was fearful of being filled with um, wrong actions, wrongful actions, um, just insidious attitude, everything that went along with me being bad. You know, the energy I put into being drunk, that was exhausting. Uh, Sneaking around, trying to figure out ways to get get booze. and, and, And it's really kind of, I don't want to say sad, but Nobody ever starts out a drunk. Nobody ever wants to be a drunk. You know, I've been drinking when I first started. I don't know how you feel about it, but, you know, as a kid, you take a sip of a beer or one of your uncles is drinking, you smell it on him and you're just like disgusted. It's so repugnant, right? And you're sipping it with your cousins. At least that's how it went down with me anyway. And, uh, you know, it's the cool thing to do. And, and through time, you know, um, especially for me, I, I hung out with a lot of older kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me, that was the end thing was, you know, sit around and have beers and, and, and to drink. And, and through time, of course, progression the way it is. It just got to be too much, man. Um, you know, an example is in the mornings, I would wake up on the bus and I could always judge, uh, temper how my day was going to go by the reaction of everybody in the front lounge. Uh. My phone had 100 texts on it that were all emergency lighted, you know. Uh, But I'd walk out in the front lounge and I'd kind of peek my head through. And if everybody kind of gave me the scuff look or a dirty look, skunk, you know, I I knew something happened the night before. But if everybody was jolly and cool, I was like, okay, I made it through another night. You know, nobody got fucking, you know, whatever. So really it, it came down to just hating it, man. The energy I was wasting on trying to be drunk and It was exhausting. It still is, even thinking about it right now. Um, I would have to say the biggest part of it, though, is my legacy. Just seeing uh, peers of mine, you know, Chester included, um, people that fought with addiction, Scott Whelan, uh, Lane Staley, of course. This is a list that just goes on and on. And um, I didn't want to be one of those headstones where people walked by and took pictures in front of it and had some some lost fucking idea of who they thought I should be or or was. Sorry about the F-bombs. You can say it. Cool. Fuck. Uh, Mm -hmm. It just, it it really came down to legacy, man. How did I want to be remembered? And how did I want my kids to go through the rest of their lives answering for me, you know, for me, and and not being proud of who their father was? Uh, All the great things that I have accomplished and continue to accomplish are still to the day, you know, overshadowed by certain things that happened when I was drunk. And those are things I'll have to live with forever. So long story long, there was a lot of different things that made me want to quit drinking. But at the end of the day, it was really uh, how I plan on leaving my name behind. Wow. So when you did decide that you wanted to get sober, what were some of your first steps? 
I mean, I, I realized I had to get sober years and years before I started actually doing it. Right. Um, I, I, if you listen to the song Tragic Truth, that was written second album, mm. you know, almost 12 years ago. So, so that goes to show I was very aware. I was conscious of, of my disease and uh, what I needed to do to stop. But there's this conflicting interest of being a rock star and having that, that stigma, I guess, uh, you know, live fast, ride hard, die young, lead a pretty corpse, that kind of thing. And I really thought that was the way to be. Uh, I, I saw myself, I, I mean, shit, dude, I didn't see myself living past 21. So every year past that to me was, was uh, borrowed time. And so I just, I can't really begin to tell you how many times that sense of entitlement uh, as a rock star kicked in and convinced me that I didn't have to be sober. It was like, dude, this is what we do. This is how we are. This is how we roll. If the tabloids aren't talking, then you're walking. And, and so I kept fighting it. And through years, <clears throat> I get all choked up. Sorry, man. Uh, you start to see things dwindle you know, whittling away at your own life piece by piece, whether it would be my friends. And I mean, I'm talking people I grew up with, um, my bandmates, my manager, Jackie, um, you know, towards the end there, I literally had four people who would even take a phone call from me. Uh, and one of them was Jackie. The other one was Kevin Churko. Uh, you know, I didn't talk to my bandmates for quite a while. Rob Halford uh, was one of them and uh, one of my counselors. So it, it got so defeating, dude to try to figure out, I, I, this is such a long answer, man. There's so many ways to go about this. At the end of the day, bro, it really comes down to, to what you're willing to do for yourself and, and how much you're willing to cost yourself and seeing the world disappear on you really helps. Mm. Being shot another singer didn't help out very much. You know, um, always having somebody to take my place. But again, it came down to socializing most of the time. Drinking for me was about relationships. It was about going out and feeling like I was a part of something. Um, you know, I live a very solo life. I always have, even since I was very small. And so for me, again, getting out and being a part of something really, it included drinking. 99.99% .99 of the time, it was going to a pub. It was after show. It was anything, you know, victorious or, or defeating. There was always a reason to drink, so. Sorry, man. I get these long-winded answers. I get kind of breathy. No, Can no. I, I like hearing it all. Uh, so, I mean, you're talking about uh, sort of uh, the link between wanting to be social and how that sort of led to drinking and stuff. Like, how have you been able to keep that socialization stuff going in your personal life while remaining sober? Being very selective about the people I'm around, for one. Uh, a lot of people never understand why I chose Vegas to live in after going through such an event, right? And continue to, be, to do so. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's very easy to walk downtown, to sit at a blackjack table, it's a very transient city. And uh, you just see people coming through sloshed. You see a girl with one heel, lost her purse. You see guys fighting. You see people getting pissed off over losing money. And they're all drunk. And you know that they would act differently if they weren't. Mm. And so immediate to me, I'm like, well, there's that scenario, which I've seen that movie a thousand times and know exactly how it fucking ends. Or there's this life over here. And again, like I stated, bro, I, I've never been a social butterfly. I, I, I'm pretty much the opposite of what you see on stage most of the time. Uh, I, I very much like my privacy. Um, but there are those moments where I need human interaction. And I think that's everyone. And so to be able to do that and go out, it's, it's been hard, man. Um, but there are good people around me and everybody understands what I'm doing. And anyone who knows me will look at me and go, we like this Ivan way more than we like that guy. <laughs> so I think it just, uh, it does the, the math itself. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned that Rob Halford was one of the few people who would take your calls during that time. I know that he helped you very much, uh, himself, uh, a very, very long time sober person. Uh, yeah. Uh, I remember Jonathan Davis also helped you uh, a bit. So how did some of those uh, contemporaries of yours uh, help you out more specifically? You know, I've talked about it in a few interviews, but I don't really think anybody got the gist of it. 
when I was in, I think it was my fifth recovery center. All right. Now that's something you have to take into mind is every time I went into recovery, I would get back out and we'd have to go right back on the road or we'd have to write a new album or something was happening. So I never had a chance to really apply it. Um, they call it practical application, day-to-day -day life, you know, living. Rob Halford had, um, of course, being in recovery himself, he's friends with my, my manager, Jackie, and he had reached out to her originally um, because, of course, the tabloids and media, he had heard a little bit of what was going on, and he sympathized. And he reached out to Jackie and he said, I really want to, to meet this gentleman. I want to know this kid. and I want him to know that somebody out here understands. And when she first told me that, it was kind of little old me. Like, yeah. really? You know, um, Rob had basically given her his phone number to give to me. And when I was in this center, we got four phone calls a day, five minute intervals. And uh, I made it a point to call him once a day uh, from a landline. And just to say hello. And that's really all he did. And I, I, when I say all he did, I don't want to downplay it because that in itself was massive. That's one of my, my heroes. Yeah. And uh, being a bastard, you know, you grow up and you kind of gravitate towards certain men, you know, as, as people look up to. And uh, he, was, he was definitely one that stood out to me. Anyway, taking those phone calls meant so much to me that somebody of a different status was, was reaching down for me and saying, it's okay, dude. Like, we've been there. I've been there. Think about this. Rob Halford, do you remember back in, I think it was the late 80s, probably not, but you've heard about it, is that, you know, he dealt with the whole kid that committed suicide, blamed their, his parents, their, yeah. his parents blamed their album. Right. Uh, out of the closet, uh, being a heavy metal singer, all of these things that he, he dealt with and still defended himself to, to the point where he could stay sober. That to me is, is iconic, man. And so again, those, those little gestures that he made of just taking my phone call and listening to me for five minutes a day, un unforgettable. Jonathan Davis is, is very, you, you have to again, take into consideration that it's the little things that really open you up. It doesn't have to be a giant movement to get you to, to pay attention. Sometimes it's just one word or two words. Jonathan Davis had one of his guys come over and collect me. Uh, I was out on, on grounds at, during a festival date. And he comes over and he goes, the boss wants to see you. I'm hmm. like, oh, everybody knows who that is, right? So I head up on the bus, you know, and I'm sitting there and JD's working on his computer. And he goes, sit down, man, sit down. Very humble, very, very quiet guy. And uh, he looks over at me and goes, Ivan, I love you, man. You've got a good career. You've got something really good going for you here. You've got a career set up. You've got blah, 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 blah. He goes, but you need to quit the sauce. It's going to kill you. He goes, that's all there is to it, bro. And I don't want to see you go like that. Wow. That was it. That was it. So, again, that was it. But in the same token, that was massive to me. For somebody that I had looked up to for years, that it has basically put me under their wing. And believe me, corn is no stranger to the Death Punch crew. They were the first band to take us out, really, and uh, had multiple reasons, much less opportunities, to kind of X us out and say, hey, you're out of here. You know, you can't keep doing that kind of shit. But they didn't. And for JD to pull me aside and take a minute out of his fucking life and say, dude, you, you need to quit the sauce. And so every time I see him to the day, it's like this unspoken visual handshake it's like dude thanks man you know so again and those are just a couple you know but um you got to remember at that time my band wasn't even talking to me um my parents had given up on me my mother um my brother and sister my friends everybody the fans had pretty much lost faith i was a firecracker on stage i didn't know what i was going to do one night to the next so people like that that actually took a second out of their their moment of life to help me adjust mine that that's really what it was dude i'm yeah. sorry i get all to talk about it man it was a big deal for me it still is that's amazing no just just uh just the act of reaching out is absolutely everything uh so you know you mentioned that you're having hard times on the road uh since you did get sober and remain sober for f almost four and a half years now 
uh, have you had an easier, better time on the road? Easier, no. Better, absolutely. Okay. Uh, never going to be easy. It's not something you just wake up one day and it's fucking gone. It, that's, that's part of that stigma. It's not something you choose, man. It's a disease. It's, it's literally embedded in your lizard brain. Mm. Um, it, it's, every day is a battle, man. Again, uh, you know, you've asked me how, how you got through it. You got to hate it. Yeah. You really fucking hate it, man. You, you have to despise it. And you've got to embrace the uncomfortability, the pain, the things that go hand in hand with, with uh, getting through those first stages of recovery. Um, God, man, this is, you could have picked any topic in the world. You picked this one. <laughs> it's a good one, I think. Uh, it is. Help a lot of people. <laughs> because people see recovery so much differently. It's different for every single person. The chemistry, it starts with the chemistry from your body all the way down to the theories of what works and what don't. It, it's just such a, I hate to even put it this way. It's such unexplored territory still. Yeah. We're still learning much about it, that it's, it's hard to decipher what works for one person may or may not work for the next. And this isn't the forties. So we don't just get to bubble everything together and throw it out there and blame it on the devil's lettuce. <laughs> True. So what are some of the things that have helped you remain sober these last years? Again, you know, it's a commitment to, to wanting to not die an asshole. Mm. Straight up. It's that <laughs> simple. Man. Um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to say it's for this, that, and the other. And at the end of the day, there are always elements, you know, my kids, of course, my band, my music, the fans. I've got so many people out there in recovery with me that I've met through our fan base. And uh, to wake up one day and to have to look them in the face and say, you weren't good enough you weren't enough to keep me going wow. uh, liquid was more powerful than my love for you what the fuck is that what kind of weak shit is that you know so it's just things like that that, that keep me going hey dude and it's it's one day i keep telling myself that every day we got today this is today put your feet on the ground accept what's coming good bad or indifferent and go with it man everybody always says life sucks i totally disagree life is fucking amazing people suck life's great you just got to learn how to uh maneuver around the people play chess better <laughs> i agree oh. with that uh yeah so uh finally with this uh you know the final question for this topic i think is uh what advice do you have for those fans or anybody else who's struggling with alcoholism sus uh, substance abuse things of that nature nikki six told me once it's an honest program mm -hmm. now that's Really fucking cheesy, but it's very, very, very true. You have to be able to identify with yourself, confront yourself, and like I said earlier, embrace the goods and the bads of yourself. You have to be willing to commit everything you've got to it. And when I say hate it, I'm talking worse than anything you've ever hated in your life. When I smell booze from across the room, I get bile in my stomach. I fucking hate it so deeply. Um, I can't, again, everybody's different. There's never going to be one solution to anything. That's just the way it is. But I've always said, and again, it sounds a little cheese, but it's the truth. And you got to communicate. You got to stay informed. Do not let people downplay you. Don't let it seem like it's, don't ever let them <clears throat> get the best of you to the point where they're make, making you start to believe that it's not what it is. You have to take it on such a level, man, that uh, make it your worst fucking enemy. And I mean that for any side of addiction. It doesn't just have to be alcohol or, or opioids or, you know, there, there's a million things in the world that can piss you off that you need to learn how to overcome. Um, my best advice to everybody is to stay true to yourself and know that if you truly, truly want to do better, you can. And you can't listen to naysaying. Again, everything that you've done good in your life will be forgotten because all anybody ever wants to remember are those little segments of shit. So look at the wake, realize what you've done and what you've left behind you, and then look forward and realize you've got a lot of fucking space to move still.